Greetings. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, I've been involved uh, with Boston University for a number of years, uh, and now I'm at UMass uh, Boston at the School for the Environment. And really, I've been fortunate to have two major mentors. One uh, is Alexander Humboldt, who I never got to meet because it was 200 years ago, and uh, Lynn Margulis, who I did have uh, had the great fortune to um, work with, was a colleague, was a friend, for many, many years at BU. As many of you know, she passed away in 2011. And um, those two people meant a lot in terms of really seeing what the biosphere is all about. And that's what I want to share with you a little bit uh, today. And uh, here we have a core characteristic of the biosphere's long life history, communities and symbiosis. Biosphere here meaning the environment in the broadest and most scientific sense, uh, where all the organisms are residing, where life is residing, and the dependencies that life has on those areas of the planet. And all of the pictures that we see here are just samples of thousands of symbiotic organisms. Symbiosis, again, being what we would call partnerships in nature, intimate ones over long periods of time. And uh, we they come in all kinds of varieties and shades, and some of you might recognize them here. Uh, even the orchid, the third one from the left, is a symbiotic organism that it's completely dependent upon fungi, right? Fungi in the roots or in the bark system that allows the orchid to actually proliferate. And it has to actually capture that fungi or at least partner with it uh, right from its very earliest stages. And uh, this is an unusual one on the right. This, this uh, is a view from uh, in the Amazon. I've led or visited the, uh, the Amazon, led several trips there over the years. Uh, this would be the remote Amazon uh, portions uh, northwest, uh, eastern Ecuador, but northwest Amazon generally. This is the Hwatsin on the right. Oh, yeah, I have one of these. Look at that. The uh, Hwatsin, this is a fabulous bird that is a, sort of a flying cow. It uh, absolutely is a fermenter. It has a major microbial population. And if you look around out here, you won't see any birds eating leaves. And this bird does. It eats leaves. Okay? And therefore, it needs a cellul cellulitic action, that is, cellulose, cellulases, to break down the leaf action and have it actually um, be able to digest it. And uh, so that's a, a very unusual. And there are many, many other examples of, of symbiotic systems. But again, it's microbial based. It's amazing, isn't it, that the most influential organisms on the earth are the ones that we cannot see. This room is filled with billions and billions of organisms, many, many Sagan units of organisms, and uh, uh, both on us, in us, and around us, right? We know that. And so we are really satellites. We're really satellites. We're seeing the overall view. We don't really, don't really see the action until we get into the microbial world. And so that's what I'm uh, sharing with you today. Uh, and we like to start right at the beginning. Uh, and it's hard in uh, half an hour or so to review 3.6 billion years. So this is my challenge. Uh, and here, this is a picture that uh, would be a representation of at least seven eighths of Earth time. And that is, these, uh, this is uh, really an ongoing picture, but one that really would date back three, uh, three billion years ago or more. And these are stromatolites, these structures down here, stromatolites, uh, these rounded structures, volcanoes. Uh, then you have archaea, which are, we see them as some uh, type of bacteria, but in some ways they're more connected actually to eukaryotes, those that have nucleus and, and mitochondria and, and bags of material uh, confined in, within a cell. Uh, in some ways, archaea are a little bit closer to that, but they are microscopic and they live along these hot sulfur areas volcanic areas, and of course shallow seas here, clouds of mm, various gases different from today, etc. But here you go, volcano, shallow seas, archaea, bacteria, our most, mm, our closest friend, the other half of us, which uh, Betsy Dyer will uh, uh, wonderfully talk about later, uh, microalgae, and of course stromatolites, these bumps, <laughs> these rocky bumps, most of Earth's 3.6 billion year history, we might say this is pretty primitive. What is this? this is, what does this really do anything? This, as Lynn would have said, <clears throat> this is a successful story right here. 
Okay, that's a successful story. In that period of time, so many things that we depend upon were invented. Photosynthesis, for example, there were photosynthetic bacteria and cyanobacteria are among that group. I always ask my students and others, anybody here photosynthesize? Uh, it's a really very powerful mechanism. Indeed, there are thousands of scientists who are still studying that around the world. So photosynthesis, you always say, oh, look at those primitive organisms, the cyanobacteria and all of these organisms are doing photosynthesis. Uh, that is, again, able to make sugars um, and being a carbon assimilator. Uh, and, um, of course, they also involved with so many other mechanisms during this time, inventing reproduction, motility, movement from place to place, energy, metabolism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's the, stromato the stromatolites. Uh, this is a well-known picture from, I think it's from the Hamlin Pool in Australia. And these are the living uh, cyanobacteria, formerly called blue-green algae, but they're not at all. They're prokaryotic. They don't have nucleus or any of that there. Uh, and they really trap materials that are coming in from, for example, shallow ocean environments. Materials meaning minerals, goodies, sponge cafe. What's the sponge cafe? Tell me the S. Take a guess. Uh, sponge cafe, you need sponge cafe. All organisms really mainly only need these eight. S. Sulfur, thank you. P. Oh, good, this is like a rally. O, oxygen, yeah, and N, yeah, C, yeah, and H, yeah, and, and the cafe, it isn't cappuccino. CA, no, we did carbon. Calcium, yeah, and FE, yeah, and that's really 97% of the story. You can all go home now. It's a sponge cafe world. Every organism, whether it's an amoeba, whether it's a, um, an orangutan or many of our other friends, uh, an orchid, a uh, bacterium, they all revolve around those eight nutrients or those elements. <clears throat> so in, in this case, again, uh, these organisms are uh, photosynthesizing the cyanobacteria on the surface, but what's happening is that they're taking in a lot of those minerals in various compounds through uh, wave action and then what's incredible is that they then spew out, much like any organism does, what they don't need anymore. And, but it, it adheres to their outer surface, and their outer surface is these polysaccharides, sticky layers or sheets, as we call them. And you can see that in this uh, picture upcoming here. Here, for example, this is lingvia. It's a type of cyanobacteria, but there are others involved with this. And, uh, and this is, it is a, it's not that great a picture, it's foggy, but at the same time, you can get a sense of what the sheaths are. It's, it's covered with this mucilaginous material that it excretes, and it traps a lot of those minerals. And then it grows through the material that it traps. It grows through it because it needs to photosynthesize. So natural selection favors that. And so you get, <clears throat> so you get then over time, these massive structures, all this or substantially uh, all this extending for really dozens of and hundreds of kilometers in some cases are built by microorganisms, cyanobacteria, okay? excreting the material after they have used parts of it. This is, all, this is one big sort of stromatolytic display. And this is a man, or a meon as they say in Boston. And uh, so you get an idea of the height and so on. So it's a stromatolytic world, and, and this is pretty dynamic. Uh, some of the biggest structures of all time are, are not built by humans, they're built by microbes, in this case cyanobacteria. And what does that connect to? What does that tell you? Cyanobacteria in great numbers were doing this at three billion years ago and all the way up to two billion years ago. Uh, not so much today, but still around. What does that tell you about the atmosphere? What came out of that cyan all those cyanobacteria? Oxygen, yeah, that's the reason why we're here today. We can take a deep breath. Thank you, cyanos, and our other microbial algal friends. All, all algal friends plus the cyanos, which are not algae per se. But that oxygen is given off as a waste product. It's used, but then given off as a waste product. It's cycled back out into the atmosphere, and that was, of course, a danger. But most organisms, or many of them, not most, but many have adapted to it, and here we are. So we can also thank cyanobacteria for that. In terms of a biosphere contribution, they definitely have 
help to build a oxygenated world. This is a picture uh, from one of the articles that I did, uh, really based a lot on just symbiosis knowledge. Uh, now we know uh, that there are two types of levels of symbiosis. One organism is taking in another organism, and instead of digesting it, instead of um, yeah, digesting it, it really tolerates it and it remains within the organism or in some way associated with it. This doesn't happen very often, but enough to change the world periodically. And uh, in this case, we have a host organism here taking in another organism. This happened with the mitochondria, uh, which are represented by those red dots. They were once free living bacteria, as many of you know. But at, afterwards, after they got their mitochondria and developed a nucleocytoplasm, they took in this, which is a cyanobacterium, and then that developed into a plastid, plastid, that was like a chloroplast, and then they became photosynthetic here. This is, this is, you couldn't get much more core than this in terms of it, answering the question of, uh, is there some important way that microorganisms have, have really fostered life on Earth? Yikes. <laughs> Mitochondria and plastids, chloroplasts, are directly from microbes. They were once free-living microbes. We know that. That's part of the endosymbiotic theory, or now just part of basic uh, biology knowledge, biosphere knowledge. But incredibly, for the groups of algae that we depend upon so much, and other organisms, but particularly algae, this organism here was then taken in by another eukaryote, heterotrophic, that is, it doesn't make its own food, and it swallows it up, and that became a lot of lineage of lineages of other algae. We call that secondary symbiosis, or secondary endosymbiosis. Primary, and in much of the, many other examples of secondary. That's pretty powerful. This is like gathering up all your whole group of genes all at once. Not through a series of mutational events, or, but rather capturing novelty and new, new ways of being in one gulp. And then it's filtered out over time, of course, or eliminated completely. So this is a big story. Um, oh, it's kind of funny that it's supposed to happen now. Oh, yeah, look at all those funny things. OK, so here's, um, here's a picture that shows this a little bit. Uh, this is Symbiodinium, which is a secondary derived alga. OK, and uh, it's added to this. What's that? What is it? Yeah, it looks like a hydra. Yeah, it's actually a polyp of a of a coral. Uh, this is the uh, again the soft stage, so to speak, um, of coral, which is an invertebrate animal. So you have two very foreign organisms. You couldn't get much more foreign than this. Okay, this is like uh, you know hippo and an orchid. Whatever you want, a crazy idea you want to bring it up. These organisms are we wouldn't think would be fitting, but they do. And together, when they're together. Uh, they actually developed this, a coral reef. There is no coral reef of substance on Earth over the millions of years that hasn't been affected by that first organism or something very similar to it, which is a dinoflagellate. Secondary symbiosis, that's a dinoflagellate alga, and it must infect, that's in a positive way, the animal in order for that system to then generate a product, and that product is a reef that may be more helpful in terms of the coral being able to have its larvae develop uh, and not float away in long distances, uh, but it also stabilizes its pH. It gets rid of the alkalinity. We do the same thing. What do we do our, um, what do we do our calcium carbonate or our calcium excretion? And don't say, oh, ignore the bathroom. Yeah, that's one excretion. But what's another excretion? What is it? Bones. You excrete it internally, okay, as well as uh, many other organisms. This excretion goes externally, making an exoskeleton, which supports much of the biodiversity of the planet. So, in a symbiotic world, one plus one equals one. It does not equal two. And you're a living example of that. You're only, you're only half here when you're born. You know that, right? I, I don't mean that, like putting humans down, like you know, something wrong with you. I mean, you're, you're only half here. The other half, 
is really, of course, the microbial populations that you need to have. So here, each individual is actually a community comparable to the larger ecosystems we depend upon globally. That's a powerful point, because then the whole story of us being so distant from all the ecosystems in the world, that we're humans, and we're in a different world, and we need to take care of this. Well, we're also an ecosystem. So we have real connections, uh, real symbiosis, if you will, with those larger communities of wetlands, rainforests, and so on. Uh, here's some example. Uh, so here we're looking at this. Uh, so we're looking at a symbiotic system, and then we're, we're saying what impact a cone effect. These symbiotic systems go like this. They start here, and they go off in a big cone, right? Like, whoops, like uh, this. And here we see it. Uh, the left picture is influencing the biosphere on a grand level over time. In some cases, over uh, tens and hundreds of millions of years. That organism on the left is, is hard to tell what it could be, but any guesses? You got a clue when I, when I hit the button too hot a second time. Yeah, I like it. Thank you. Yeah, I like your comment. Uh, there it is. Yeah, there's actually a couple of species here. That's uh, Gladina rangiferina, which is a reindeer lichen on the left, and this is Cladonia, which is a, called the British soldier. Uh, lichens uh, dominate a lot of surfaces of the earth and, of course, are widespread. This is a combination of an alga and a fungus, and this has tremendous influence on the planet. For example, here, uh, entire uh, systems like the tundra support uh, a whole web of other organisms, various mammals, elk, and so on, that eat the lichens throughout much of the year. Uh, they also uh, break down the bark on rainforest surfaces and really allow for e epiphytes to develop. And epiphytes are a characteristic of rainforests, right? Plants that live on other plants. And we see that here. Plants don't grab hold and get going on a surface unless the surface is broken down somewhat. Lichens, as well as bacteria, play a big role in that. And again, a, li a lichen is a fungal algal combination. So symbionts act as element recyclers and, and ecosystem builders in the biosphere. Again, a powerful influence, and just one of many examples, of course. Um, oh yeah, we're looking uh, right into, uh, what is that? Yeah, sea anemone, right, sea anemone, and, uh, and, <clears throat> and I thought I'd put it here, it's a good place to put the sea anemones acquiring this definition. This is a Zook definition, it's very Zookiistic, but you know, it, my students always liked it. I inherited Lynn's course in symbiosis, uh, 25, well, it's almost 30 years ago now, but uh, and I taught it for 25 years. Lynn said, you have to teach it, don't give it up, go to the end with it, etc. So I did that, but I am still alive, and, uh, and I really thought this definition was a little bit more concrete because the living together over long periods of time seemed a little ambiguous. Insects living within the bark of an organism, uh, a tree, for example, live together. They definitely support each other. The waste from the insect goes into the soil and supports the roots. The tree is providing a home, et cetera, et cetera, for the insect. That's not symbiosis. It's just one of a billion ecological relationships. Symbiosis is more specific. It's the acquisition of one organism or others by another unlike organism or others, and through subsequent long-term integration, intimacy, new metabolism and new structures results. And they can be microbial structures or larger structures. In the case of the corals, one of them is the reef. That's, that's a clear example of this definition. And then, uh, so uh, we have also this example in symbiosis. Uh, on the left, that is a mycorrhizal fungi in a, in a, uh, scanning, uh, in a scanning electron micrograph <coughs> being within the uh, roots, within a root cell. I think of a ginkgo in that case. And this is, of course, the Earth. And again, the cone effect is very high. Obviously, this would be just the dot on the screen, but I make it bigger so you can see it. But the emphasis of the importance of mycorrhizal fungi on the Earth, as many of you know, is enormous. It's a symbiotic organism with almost all of our plants. Um, and mycorrhizae and other fungi, massive 400 million year old biospheric impact continues to this day. <clears throat> And we see it here with arbuscles. They form like these tree-like structures here that actually then go out of the cells and out here and out here and way out outside the room and down the street on the ground because they spread out their hyphae there to get nutrients and bring it into the tree roots. 
And here we have some ectomycorrhizae. These do not penetrate in the same way. They stay on the outside of the cells as well as the outside of the root. And many of the, many of the plants have that kind of symbiosis, this mycorrhizal fungal symbiosis. And some of them, of course, on the ecto level, uh, have fruiting bodies, uh, which we call mushrooms. Okay, so those of you, many of you have eaten mycorrhizae and loved it. Sauteed, sauteed those mushrooms, and I know I'm making you hungry, so I'll talk a little faster. So yeah, so these are mushrooms. This is, uh, I think it's Lycaria. Anyways, I took that picture many years ago. This is a, it's a plant dispersal and distribution determinant. We could argue that symbiosis is that in the sense of mycorrhizae. Since, since the, uh, most plants absolutely need that kind of a partner and vice versa. Okay, and uh, here it contributes, of course, as well to all of this. So fungal symbionts as ancient ongoing foundations of biomes and ecosystems. So again, the expression of symbiosis, especially microbial symbiosis, is why we see a rainforest. We would not see that. Well, we could conceive of something else, but it wouldn't be real. It would be truly fake news. So here, here all of this is due to the partnerships that these trees, these wonderful organisms, our best friends on Earth, I would argue, uh, because there's such a carbon drawdown on multiple levels. Uh, and they, they are associating with these, uh, with these fungi and exchanging nutrients, mostly phosphorus, uh, in some cases nitrogen, but, but others as well. Um, and even grasses. Uh, grasses, symbionts as the foundation of biomes. Biomes meaning ecosystems on a grander scale. Biome has many different ecosystems. Biome will be rainforest, grassland, the terrestrial forest, and so on. These are grasses, and many of them, especially fescue grasses, have a, not only mycorrhizae, but they also have, um, as you see here, they are also get infected by a fungi along their comb and all, what we would call their stem area. And even inside the seeds, we're looking inside the seed of one of the grasses, and these are fungi that have infected inside. We call them endophytic fungi. And lo and behold, with those grasses, they actually need that fungal relationship, apart from the mycorrhizal one. So there's two, there's two symbionts of fungal in many grasses of the world. And in this case, it actually provides drought resistance, very important in the climate change world. You get more dominant grasses in some areas because of the drought, um, the drought protection that this association gives a lot of the grasses. Natural selection has favored that relationship over time. Here you can even see some of the uh, fungi within, within, uh, in between the, the uh, grass cells itself. Uh, here's another cone effect. This is a, oh, this is a good friend of mine, the cocoa lithophore, beautiful organism. Uh, we all are in the coccolithophoric world because we deal with concrete, and much of concrete is calcium carbonate. Uh, in fact, uh, Portland cement has to be at least 50% calcium carbonate, and much of the calcium carbonate, not all, but much of it, I would say most of it, comes from living organisms. And much of it is in the platforms of the earth, right? It's in the ge uh, geology, in the pedosphere, and in the upper lithosphere generally. And so these two also, one is feeding the other, feeding the biosphere greatly is this coccolithophore, and it has these tests, these shells on it, uh, which are called tests, and these are all calcium carbonate, very beautifully intricate, again, a microorganism, but very complex, very elaborate, and with amazing life cycles as well. The remains of uh, cal uh, calciferous, uh, calcareous, really, should be microbial algae which rose through symbiosis uh, dominates vast regions of the biosphere, ocean sediments and land masses. If you uh, don't do this because I'll get arrested, but if you went outside Notre Dame and you drill down with a drill in, in France, uh, you would be drilling through meters and meters of these tests, these beautiful vocal tests. And in fact just about 70 percent of Europe and also um, across much of the Atlantic. The platforms of the earth and under the waters are substantially this organism, or the remnants of it, as well as others, but particularly that one. Um, well, you know that the pyramids are all microbial remnant. They're from Globigerina mainly, which is a foraminifera, a little bit different than this one. 
Oh, yeah, how oh, neat. Thank you. So here's a, here's a picture. Uh, this uh, white area is Scotland, Hebrides, a famous picture from the 80s. And this is uh, North Atlantic. And uh, here you see uh, Scotland, and here you see Amelia, this is this is one incredible bloom extending for hundreds of kilometers of Emiliana, uh, which is very common, uh, albeit perhaps somewhat threatened now by uh, anthropogenic climate change. Uh, Emiliana is an important carbon assimilator. It dominates. Just think of the uncountable numbers. These are microbes seen from space in one big mass. And Emiliani is, some people consider it uh, the most common eukaryote in the world, is Emiliani. And so it pretty much goes like this. The coccolith tests are, 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 fall to the bottom of the sea over time as they die. As they go through their life cycle, the ocean is above it. Uh, and then you have through orogeny, the land lifting, or other changes in the, ge in the geology. You then have trees growing on top of the coccoliths. Um, and then you have salute, differential dissolution, meaning water gets in there and begins to break it up, form caves, um, and ca form low areas and high areas. It's differential from precipitation. And then over time, this happens over many years, you get hills developing, and down below you have caves, all calcium carbonate, all biogenic, microbiogenic from living organisms. And then you have mountains and hills that we call limestone. And that's pretty common, 25% of China, 30% of uh, New Zealand, on and on and on, are substantially limestone on the upper lithosphere. So yeah. So microbial algae is a primary source of global limestone deposition, geomorphology, and element sequestration, carbon, calcium, and so on, and cycling. This is not trivial. This is big time biosphere stuff. Um, and so again, the influence of symbiosis on just one ecosystem here, the placids and the leaves we said are from a primary symbiosis. Uh, lichens hanging off branches like you see over here, these are lichens. Uh, and then on the bark itself, they're also from a symbiotic microbial uh, system. Mycorrhizae and salts and detritus. Wow, I mean, in soils rather than detritus, I mean, this is this is a common rainforest picture, but yet it's really a microbial influence, and of course, then projects all the way to the biosphere systems. Oh, look at that. Uh, this is a, a great symbiosis. Again, this is just looking at, uh, again, anemone uh, tentacles, and this is the green algae that's making this color. They are infected, they're within cells, this is a close symbiotic relationship. So this animal can actually photosynthesize. Because carbon is transferred uh, from this green alga to the so-called host cells here. So symbiosis is really a dominant uh, in, a, in marine life strategy. It's very common. You see the corals here across the board. You see it here with corals, speaking of them. Symbiosis has biodiversity determinants. Yeah, because if you have a reef, you know you're going to have a very biodiverse world. So an oasis in the seas, right? Tropical seas don't have much life. They don't have much nutrients coming up, okay, because there's no cold water sinking. So it tends to be kind of vacuous in terms of a lot of biodiversity, except in these oases, these coral reef areas. And of course, we're losing the reefs. It's one of the major stories of today, right? One of the major dangers today. We're losing the reefs, mainly because of what you see here. We said here global warming indicators. Wow, these are dead. This is alive, but certainly fading. Okay, and there are thousands of pictures of this. We, we know this is happening. Uh, this is a mm, very problematic. Some people say, well, the Earth will go on and all of that, but uh, microbes, of course, will go on. That may be so, but with, when humans are the cause, or at least part of the cause, even if we say, well, we're stuck with that, but remember, we have to work at it if for no other reason than we're bringing down many other organisms and ecosystems that have nothing to do with the problem. I get that all the time with students as they, well, you know, yeah, so humans go, goodbye humans, and they screwed it up. It's, it, yeah, okay, but it's not that easy. It's, we're taking so many other systems that, w that we really wouldn't want to have gone from the earth that they didn't contribute to the problem in any significant way. Uh, so uh, 
Many images in the biosphere, such as this one from King County, uh, New Zealand, can be interpreted as primarily the result of symbiotic reactions, microbial ones, involving at least one microbial species. Mycorrhizae in the grass, anthropic fungi, coccoliths, which are what these are here. DMS is gases given off by algae that uh, contribute to cloud formation. Uh, plastids, photosynthesis, lichens on the rocks. We could go anywhere, anywhere. We could look outside this building, look at the mortar in between the building, we could look at the, the surfaces, we could, and, and even in urban environments and see this kind of, of projection. Speaking of projection, here's another one. This is a diatoms in the earth. This is a microbial algae, a diatomation, diatom. And again, it has this cone effect. It's spreading out and making an influence on the planet. And this is an amazing one. It's a foundation of global ecology. Uh, microbial algae such as diatoms from the Sahara, North Africa. Diatoms from the Sahara are both vehicles and sources for sustaining uh, the Amazon. Mm -hmm. How could that be? Well, here's Chad, and it's really a Chad story. I don't mean a 2000 election, Chad. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, the country of Chad, you know, we have this whole view, we're so uh, USA-centric and so uh, human-centric and USA-centric that we don't realize that these are very big countries with a lot going on and that we depend upon Chad indirectly, everyone in this room indirectly. Yikes. And Chad has actually, uh, can include all of California, um, I think our, all of Oregon and Washington. And, and, and Chad, just to give you an idea of size. <clears throat> That's where it's located. These are some of the many people there. Incidentally, all these people that are so-called third world people. To me, from an Earth standpoint, they're probably first world people. Their carbon footprint is near zero. So, they just don't use much energy. They just, they just don't. They're just more sustainable oriented. Not completely, but compared to us, so comparison systems that we developed and what we're depending upon in this room right now. Uh, so here you go, the global flow, Sahara to Amazon, say what? What's Zook talking about again? What a weirdo. So here again, the Sahara area, all this, this mineral dust accumulating here. That mineral dust is substantially from diatoms and moving over to the Amazon. And it's, uh, we now know that it's due in part to this kind of flow of winds from uh, two magmatic uh, volcanic areas that are now dormant, but the flow of wind comes, they call the Hamatan winds, come and lift this Bodele dust, which was a formerly part of this big lake. See the small lake here? Well, it used to be very big like this. So now all that's left is sediment. And what lived in that sediment? Diatoms, microbial algae, friends of ours, very huggable. <laughs> At least by uh, us in here, I'm sure all of us. So here, here is uh, the result. A lot of that nutrient flow is coming across the Atlantic and landing in, in the Amazon, a good portion of it, in the hundreds of thousands of tons. Yeah, and, that, and this is a very healthy river here. That's why you can see it's nice and brown, and, and there's a lot of development here, uh, tree development and so forth. That's in Tipitini, Yasuni, Eastern Ecuador. And a lot of it is due to these diatoms, which are dead, uh, and accumulate on the bottom of the, where the lake used to be, and that's picked up as dust and goes off into the atmosphere and comes across the Atlantic and contributes to this. What is this place? It looks like Acadia. It looks like Acadia, yeah. But it is. Uh, it's, it's where you get your drinking water, or most of us here in the Boston area, it's popping. And you notice that right away, you see there's no industry here. This is a cool place, right? I mean, and it's well protected and some of the best water in, in the world. For that matter, it comes from, from uh, it's Boston water. And again, uh, low pressure systems form near the equator. True, low pressure systems form near the equator uh, due to the rising transpiration from trees, water feeding the trees. And a lot of that rain comes right back down. But some of it becomes part of low pressure systems that move around the earth and bring water to the world. A lot of it is, of course, through evaporation. But in this case, through transpiration and trees, and so you have our drinking water in part, not completely at all, but in part coming from our rainforest areas. And due to this movement of nutrients that the trees need in the Amazon, because 
They just don't have that much nutrients in the soil. So diatoms can be quite beautiful, all different shapes. And here's a view of the dust, actually. You can actually see it from satellite view coming up. This narrow, small area in the Sahara. So 0.2% of Sahara area, which is equivalent to 0.5% of the Amazon, fertilizes the South American tropical forests and portions of the Atlantic. Are you kidding me? 0.2%. Most of the nutrients transferred are phosphorus and iron, uh, essential parts of the life sponge cafe. <clears throat> Who would ever think that Sahara is what's keeping the Amazon going? This is it here. You can see some of the dust, this brown area coming off the uh, western African coastline, and that will move westward at different times of year. <clears throat> Lastly, there's one more connection that I wanted to show to you, and that's the one in some of the handouts that you have, and I have another copy there. Another influence on the globe that we're not hearing about, and what I'm involved with in this Global Ecology Education Initiative are uh, people such as the ones we see here. I didn't actually go out and do this program initially a few years ago, um, looking for you know people of color. I wasn't looking for anything other than who is showing leadership in countries around the world about sustainability and making learning about the biosphere and connecting to it and trying to preserve our relationship with it or making a better relationship. Who's doing that around the world? And I found all these people, literally thousands. These are just some that are really well known in other countries and in some circles, uh, who are doing that, but it's not in any schools. You won't find it in most any schools or curriculum, but yet you'll hear about other people, right? And so we need now, in a climate change time, and the need for greater a resur a resurrection or renewal of life on the planet, we need to hear and be inspired by these people. It, 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 now, I've seen it in classes. I go to various high schools and I give presentations. It's a whole different story when the students see this around the world. Many of them are connected to those countries. Many of them see people that look like them. Uh, whatever. They just get much more interested. They say, oh, wow, I thought this was more like a thing in the United States and it dealt only with people from Newton. I mean, whatever. They, and, and they don't mean it even in a mean way. They said, I just didn't realize this was on this grand scale. This should be in curriculum, in high school and college level. Um, for, and especially someone like uh, Wangari Matai, she's usually won the Nobel Prize in 2005 uh, for her Green Belt Movement, planting over 50 million trees, organizing 10,000 women in Kenya. That should be known by people, it should be part of the curriculum. And so they have a powerful effect. And in that sense, I'm asking also uh, my own plug here for the Global Ecology, it would be important to get out to schools more and demonstrate this and do the programs that I do. And also we want to develop a website that has this curriculum friendly. It's interactive and can be used in schools by students and by teachers. And that requires some support. Unfortunately, a lot of the foundation support is very STEM oriented. Are you teaching how to do lab skills so that they can get jobs in corporate environment? I'm glad other people are doing that. We're not doing that. We're trying to build knowledge and inspiration for people to get more involved in climate change and other environmental biosphere issues. And this is a great vehicle to do it. Uh, there are hundreds of indigenous grassroots leaders, peoples around the world, creating and practicing a more earth-centered ethic. They need to be included in high school and college curricula if we are to inspire young people to prioritize nature protection and sustainable solutions. The GEI mm, Earth Care Program, based at UMass Boston School for the Environment, seeks your help for overcoming this profound omission. See, read the handout available here this morning. I'll leave some at the desk. I don't want to harass you. Um, uh, or contact me at this uh, email and become an earth care donor. A few dollars, hundred dollars, million dollars, whatever. <laughs> actually, the smaller numbers are actually better. You know? um, this effort is, uh, is worth it. Uh, it's worth your time. That's, that's kind of clever, isn't it? <laughs> don't I get applause for that or something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyways, uh, it's worth your time and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice rest of the day in conference.